survival. That's what we want to be talking about today. The survival of a nation. And that's our topic as we just focus on the things that are happening around and about us today. But allow me just to begin in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much. Father, for the opportunity to gather together, Lord God, in this house, your house, Lord, a house of prayer, a house of fellowship. And Lord God, as we have gathered together, Lord God, we know and believe that you are here. We sense your presence, Jehovah God. And we ask in the name of Jesus that it will please you, Lord God, Father, to cause us to be attentive even to the ministry of your word. Father, I pray, Lord God, that each of us, Lord God, would have open hearts and ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church. I also commit myself to you, Lord God, and yield to you, Holy Spirit of the living God. May it please you, Lord God, to use me, those things that I have considered in my heart and mind. Take them, Lord God, and cause them, mighty Father, even to be stirred in the lives of all your children seated here. And even those, Lord God, Father, who via Facebook, Lord Jesus Christ, and YouTube would be able to connect and engage with us through this service. Blessed be your name. Help us, Lord God, not just to be hearers of your word, but also doers of the same. We honor you and we bless you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're talking about the survival of this nation, our nation, Kenya. Those of you who have been around for a bit of time will remember that after independence, our founding fathers identified three challenges that threatened the survival of our nation. And I can see some of you already nodding. Those three challenges indeed were poverty, ignorance, and disease. Over the years since independence, our country has noted the expansion of educational institutions and those have fostered an increased literacy across the populace of this country so that our literacy rates today stand at about 82%. And we thank God for that. That's a positive thing as a developing country. That's a good place. There's still room for improvement. However, the other two challenges, poverty and disease, together with a number of other social ills, continue to bedevil us as a people and as a nation. And I know you know them as well as I do. Corruption, greed, negative ethnicity, the breakdown of good communal and national values. And we could go on and mention more. With regard to disease, just last week, our president announced that a second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic has gripped our nation. And because of that, we have noted an increase in the number of deaths, in the number of those who are being hospitalized, and a lot of negative impact to the livelihoods of many. From the beginning of this COVID pandemic in this country, in sometime mid-March this year, one measure, if you recall correctly, one measure that has been consistently stated over that period until now with regard to how to manage or take risk to address and curb this pandemic is that of each of us taking personal responsibility. And we are to take personal responsibility by doing things like being careful about our hand hygiene so that wherever you are, whether at home or at workplace, or even when you come to church, you wash your hands and you wash them well and thoroughly. Of course, we've got hand washing stations out here to help us with the same. We're also to take personal responsibility by observing what is called respiratory etiquette, by wearing a face mask. And also, when you sneeze, to make sure that you don't sneeze out, you cover your mouth as you sneeze. We're also to keep a good distance. It's called physical distance, about 1.5 meters or 1.2 meters from one person to another. These and other interventions 
uh, what we have been advised to adopt as individuals and as a nation in order to survive. But I believe that as Christians, there is something more fundamental that you and I ought to do in order to survive. And this is a command. God commanded us and he commands us through his scripture. And we can see that in the story or in the words or in the command that God spoke to a young leader of a nation about 3,000 years ago. Ancient wisdom spoken by God to this leader. Ancient wisdom from the ancient of days. Allow me to read the details of the message that God spoke to this leader. This leader happened to be named Solomon. He was Israel's third king. The account is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 from verse 12. And I'll be reading this from the New American Standard Bible. But you can follow with me in the scripture version that you have. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 from verse 12 all the way to 22. And if you're there with me, you can say amen. Amen. 2 Chronicles 7, 12 says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David did, even to do according to all that I have commanded you, and will keep my statutes and my ordinances, then I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with your father David, saying, You shall not lack a man to be ruler in Israel. But verse 19 says, but if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot you from my land, which I have given you. And this house, which I have consecrated for name, I will cast out of my sight, and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. As for this house... Which, has, which was exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? And they will say, because they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers who brought them from the land of Egypt, and they adopted other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this adversity on them. The Lord bless the reading of his word. And so at this time, Solomon was a young leader of the young nation of Israel. He had just completed the construction of the temple and had dedicated it. And upon dedicating this temple, the glory of the Lord had filled the temple. Solomon must have been elated, looking ahead to accomplishing great things for the Lord and great things for the people of God, Israel. Indeed, that was a great day. But later that very evening, the evening that he had made a prayer of dedication to God and God's glory had filled the house of God, this temple. Later that evening, Solomon is alone in his room. And while he's there, the Lord visits him and begins talking to him. I'd like us to note that Solomon doesn't say a word. It's a monologue from God to Solomon. Solomon is attentive, simply listening to what God is saying, as you and I should be doing when God speaks to us. 
And in verse 13, God tells Solomon this. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. Let me paraphrase what God was telling Solomon. God was telling Solomon this, that my son, there may be some difficult days ahead, some challenging times. Tell Solomon that there might be drought so that there would be famine and hunger in the land. He tells Solomon that there are times that I may have to send a locust invasion amongst you so that whereas you may have planted your seed and indeed you have ready to go and harvest a lot and to bring in all that you may have invested in, the locusts may come amongst you so that that which you expected to harvest, you will not harvest. It will all go to the mouths of these scavenging locusts. God tells Solomon that in the days ahead, there may be pestilence and disease. Why? Because of the sin of the people. You see, God knew his people. And he knew that they were prone to sin. And sometimes he used such judgments in order to realign them back to himself. So God cautions Solomon in advance and tells him the days ahead may be difficult. But then God proceeds to tell Solomon this. That if it so happens that you come across difficult days and you're wondering what to do in order to survive, this ought to be your response, Solomon. Lead your people in prayer such that you humble yourself. Number one, Two, you pray. Number three, you seek the face of God. And number four, you turn from your wicked ways. That was to be Solomon's response to lead the people of Israel. If it so happened that they encountered days of drought, if they encountered days of famine, days of difficulty and pestilence and disease, they were to do those four things. Humble themselves, pray, seek God's face, and turn from their wicked ways. That's what God told them in order that they would survive the difficult days. You see, God had connected, and indeed he connects the survival or the destiny of a nation to the prayers of his people. Your prayers, my prayers our prayers together. That's what causes a nation or this nation to survive. That's what causes this nation to survive. You see, throughout this pandemic period, one habit that some people may have adopted is this. Waiting for the COVID-19 briefings. Waiting to hear what the Minister of Health or the director of health, or what the president is saying with regard to the pandemic. And there is no problem in listening to those things. But you see, the thing is this, sometimes we listen to them and we look for signs of hope from them. We look for solutions from them. We are looking for good news from them so that we are sitting here waiting, asking each other, what are the numbers today? How many people were infected? What's happening in my home county? How come this and that is happening? Looking to hear some good news. God tells you and I this today. The destiny or the survival of this nation is in your prayers. My prayers. So that we are not to be waiting for hope by the word of the government leaders. Indeed, God has assigned them authority and rulership. But from this text, it's clear. If you and I are to survive, it is by the prayers that we are to lift up to God. These times of trouble and pandemic are times that we as believers are called to prayer. 
so that while it is good for us during this pandemic to observe hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette and indeed to ensure that there is good physical distance between us as believers, this is our personal responsibility to pray. That's what our personal responsibility is. To pray. To pray. So I urge all of us who are here, don't sit and wait for January the curfew to be lifted. Don't sit and wait for this and that measure to be de-escalated. The lifting of the curfew, the de-escalation of those measures, indeed, the riddance of this disease from our community and society, where does that lie? In our prayers. That's what God told Solomon. In times of pestilence, in times of disease, if my people, my people, those called by my name, those who are born again, those who know Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives, if those ones humble themselves, if those ones pray, if those ones turn from their wicked ways, if those ones seek my face and repent, this is what God promises. He tells them this, verse 14b, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14b. In response to prayer, this is what God says, Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Three things. I will hear, I will forgive, I will heal. Oh, how many of you believe that Kenya be needs some healing today? That our families and our households as individuals, as societies, we need healing today. That our economy needs healing. We need healing. God promises to respond that way if his people, that's if you and I, pray. And then verse 15 says this, Now my eyes will be open to my, and my ears attentive to the prayers offered. So that God, he's waiting to hear our prayers. He's just waiting to hear the people of God lifting their voice in prayer to him. So that he may act to heal. So that he may act to forgive. That's what he's waiting for. The prayers of his people. So let's not wait only for the COVID-19 briefings. Let's be at the place of prayer. And there are different ways that we can commit ourselves in prayer. And that we must as believers. We can commit ourselves in personal prayer. And I want to challenge us. Look at your prayer life. How's your prayer life? Corporate prayer. We have corporate prayer or public prayer sessions right here. Wednesdays from 5.30 onwards. You're welcome to come and participate with us here in a time of prayer. Sunday morning from 8.30, you're welcome to come. And I will say particularly... If you know you cannot make the Wednesday prayer for one purpose or another, then what you should target? Sunday morning service. I'll come by 8.30 so that I can participate with my fellow believers in prayer. God takes the prayers of his people so seriously. So seriously. He waits to hear that he may pray, that he may answer. As I invite the worship team up, to just guide us in a song so that we may proceed in prayer. Let me share the seriousness of the prayers or the seriousness with which God takes prayer. I recall a couple of years back, by God's grace, I was, able, I was able to visit Israel, the land of Israel. And I remember we went to the old town. The tour guide took us to the old town, Jerusalem. 
And one of the things you'll see there, and I know those of you who have been there, or some of you who may have watched it via TV, is what is called the Wailing Wall, you know? where people write their prayers on slips of paper and they go and they make their prayer and they slip it in the wall. I was privileged to go to that place. And that place was so emotive, full of emotional nostalgia. And when I went there, for a moment I was just struck by the awesomeness of God. My mind went back to this text. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 40, I think it is. Where Solomon makes the prayer first and says, Now, Lord, as he dedicates the temple, may your eyes be open to this place. And may your ears be attentive to the prayers made in this place. And you know, when we went there, the tour guide had told us, You see these stones here, this wall? This wall is amongst the walls of Solomon's temple. That's what he told us. I don't think it's true, but when you're there, I tell you, you'll believe it. And captured by the emotion, the powerful emotion of that verse. You see, God, when he comes to speak to Solomon, he repeats that same verse in Second Chronicles 7 15 he tells Solomon now my eyes are open to the prayers made in this place and my ears are attentive to prayers offered here so while I was there standing before the wailing wall I first had to organize my thoughts and my heart which prayer should I make here God's eyes are looking at this place and his ears are attentive to this place. Solomon had stretched out his hands and dedicated the temple and God had responded and said, yes, I'm looking at that place. My eyes are open to that place. My ears hear the prayers made in that place. So I organized my thoughts. Because I knew that this has to be the most important prayer I'll ever have made. I'll not tell you what I prayed for. <laughs> but that was the emotion of the moment. The reality of the matter is this. You and I who are here need not to make a pilgrimage to the old city of Jerusalem to make a prayer that the Lord will hear. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has opened the way for us to find and have access to the one who hears the prayers that we make. He's ready here and now, willing to listen to your prayer and my prayer concerning our lives as individuals, concerning this nation, concerning your family. Same God, same intention. The difference is this, you don't need to go to Israel. He hears you even here, where you are right now. And I want to ask the worship team to lead us in that song as we all arise and just take some time. We have got three prayers that we want to make today. We want to pray in confession and in repentance just in line with what this scripture says uh, that we are to make a prayer of confession and turn from evil we want to secondly make a prayer of healing over this nation that the Lord will heal us uh, and finally we want to rededicate ourselves to the Lord and our elders will be coming to guide and help us as we make that prayer but worship team just let's go ahead hallelujah come on just go ahead and join hallelujah we bless your name. Hallelujah.